Hi there and welcome to the Woodland Reboot if you're new to the channel. I'm Peter here at the Reboot and I've been up to some interesting things during the last year and a half. I've owned this property, these 10 acres, for the last two years. And for the last year and a half I've been busy building a 32 by 48 pole barn. I started by purchasing a sawmill, purchasing logs, spruce logs, 12 footers and 16 footers. I milled up all the lumber required for the construction of this pole barn. So if you want to see how I turned some pretty gnarly bush like this into this 32 by 48 foot pole barn. 12 foot ceilings and as I mentioned earlier I bought all the 12 foot and 16 foot logs, milled them on my Woodland Mills sawmill, created all the lumber I needed for the project except, except for the trusses and I'll explain that a little bit later on. So if you're interested in this kind of project putting together a pole barn that you can use as a shop, storage, some kind of garage, you've found the right channel. Stick with me for the next 25 minutes and I'll show you how I built this over a year and a half time period compressed down into about 25 minutes. Also guys, if you like what you see, please subscribe, like, and share. Thanks for finding my channel. Please enjoy. This building looks great in the sun. I'm proud of it. I'm really excited that I was able to build it. And I think with little time and planning, you could also put together a building like this. Overall, I think I have about 40 plus videos that show the construction process. In this video, I'm gonna share with you the process that I went through over the course of pretty much a year and a half that started with opening the land, purchasing logs, sawing the logs into lumber, building the foundation, raising the walls, installing the metal roof, metal siding, doors, windows, etc., you name it, to build a pole barn. The summer of 2018, I bought nearly 11 acres of land out near Merrickville, Ontario. We own a city lot, and there's no way you could build a 32 by 48 pole barn in downtown Ottawa. The next step was to create access to my land, and I don't own any heavy equipment. So what did I do? I called in the boys with the proper equipment to start building me a driveway and a place where I could start my construction project. As the excavator clears the area for my driveway, you're noticing or you can notice a very important aspect of the land. This part of my land where I'm building the driveway or having the driveway built and where I'm going to be building my pole barn, I am on bedrock. You can see here that there's only about 6 inches and in most of the area where I'm building anywhere from 6 inches to 18 inches of ground cover and then you hit the bedrock. This is an important and defining factor of the area where I'm building. Keep it in mind as I explain other parts of the build process in the next few minutes. Gravel was brought in and the driveway and the construction area started to take shape. Here, there's my big pile of logs. I think it's about 72 spruce that I'm uh, going to get ready to mill up. That long and narrow gravel pad is going to be for the wood mill. With the sawmill in place, I was able to start loading logs and start sawmilling. I decided to saw the lumber for my pole barn. You don't have to do this. Lots of good lumber in those stores, everybody. For whatever reason, I have a fascination with these sawmills, so I took on this challenge. It's not easy, a lot of work, takes a bit of time, but well worth it. With the logs all sawed into lumber and a place to store my equipment in the shed that you see there, I now needed to clear more area, more of the land for the actual pole barn position. So you see an excavator here, again not me, someone I brought in for the day, clearing more of the topsoil off of the bedrock. And this is important because in a minute you're going to start to see how I uh, start to build and make the piers and then have the foundation poured. But again, key thing, I'm right on top of the bedrock. And here's the second load of gravel for the day.
with this initial layer of the pad in place, it's now time for me to start to make the piers. It's important also to note that I've been doing this project 100% off-grid. So my power comes from generators. In terms of the water that I need for the project, I created a rainwater harvesting system on my shed. To have a look at what I built, click the link above to take you to that video. Preparing the pad and the foundation was a major component of this project. I recommend you visit this link to see all of the videos concerning that part of the project. I added fiber mesh to the concrete mixture for the piers. On here today we've got the first load of gravel dropped off we're going to bring up the bed so that it's four inches shy of the top of all the piers and I'm gonna to try to get that comp that compacted today as well so there's another load of gravel coming from What I'm doing right now is marking the piers. I'm putting uh, a four inch mark on the piers. That's the height to which we want the compacted gravel to come up to. And the remaining four inches up top here will be the actual concrete slab. And I hired a two person crew, one driving operating this uh, front end loader and another person who you'll see in a few minutes operating a laser level to ensure that the uh, gravel bed is at the right level. I compacted the gravel with this rented machine as the crew spread it around and measured to ensure it was at the correct depth. I completed the compacting the next day until the surface of the pad was nice and smooth. I decided to split the concrete pours into eight foot strips so that came down to four separate concrete pours and that's just because I was going to be managing the concrete with uh, my children. The first roughly eight foot strip is formed up I've got it attached on the outside here with uh, nails and screws to the piers as well as the uh, front here and at the back down there. In the middle here it's secured at this end obviously to this board and the same thing at that end and in between there two by six by sixteen foot longs are patched together and tomorrow morning I'm going to drive stakes into the ground uh, two to three per 16 footer to better secure it. So I think I'm gonna go ahead and call in the concrete for tomorrow around noontime. Make no doubt about it, this is hard, heavy work. The concrete pours were among the hardest work in the entire project. That and putting the trusses on, which of course it's coming up in uh, the next few minutes. But um, again, we are novices. 
my daughter and I have worked a little concrete on a project that we did at our cottage a couple years ago and uh, you know I think it was 10 feet long sorry 10 feet wide and 24 feet long just one pour so this is one of four eight feet wide 48 feet long and it was a warm day middle of the summer and boy this, this was heavy work I can't emphasize that enough if you're planning to take on this project I strongly recommend that you uh, have more than one helper. At the end of the day, the operator was extremely help helpful. You can see him helping out quite a bit. And uh, if it wasn't for his assistance, it would have been uh, that much harder. At the end of the day, we learned as we went along with these four uh, pours, and we probably should have, uh, I don't know if it's increased or decreased the slump, but whichever direction that would have made it a little bit more liquid and easier uh, to pour and push around. My daughter joined me for the third and fourth pours. This again was very challenging work. My hat is off to them for agreeing to come out and help me. They didn't have to, they did. Greatly appreciated. I think they learned something, probably most of all that they didn't really want to do this for <laughs> any type of summer work in the future. But at the end of the day, I thank them. We've just finished the fourth pour. Cavanaugh McNamee there is cleaning up their truck. My daughter's helping. There it is, finished right there. And what I'm going to do now is get ready to uh, start hitting it with the bowl float to smooth it out and bring up the cream. many careful measurements, each peer then received a saddle. Okay, I'm now putting the saddles in the piers. The holes have been drilled out. You've seen that in the video. I've got what's called Sika Pro Select for bonding metal into concrete. Doing those final bits of trim on the posts and then finally getting the opportunity to stand the posts up, bring this structure up out of the ground, is by far the most exciting part of this process for me. One post led to two posts and before you know it, at the end of the first day I had three posts standing and one row of girts. If you plan to take on a project like this, 
You really have to have patience and be prepared to put a plan in place that allows you to follow a very systematic approach to implementing the project, especially if you do it as a one-person operation, for the most part a one-person operation. Well, everybody, after about four days of hard work, and not four solid days of hard work, I did a couple days last week, a couple days this week, and that's just assembly. I'm not talking about preparation and getting all of the lumber in place, and obviously it's taken me half a year to mill all the lumber. There it is, there's one wall, one framed wall up. Now, I haven't completed the wall, but I'm going to do the top plate once I get the other wall up over there. Um, I will hit both walls with a laser level and then measure them out and cut off the posts at the top so they're all the same level. Now let's get on with the second wall. Okay, I've just started assembling the third wall, the back wall, and it is a little crooked right now, but give me a few minutes and I'll get this stuff straightened out. The first thing you'll notice here is that these posts are not six by sixes. These are only four by fours. The front and back walls are not load bearing and therefore do not require six by six posts. It's more than adequate to build these walls using four by fours, so that's what I'm gonna do. My original plan included a garage door in the back wall, however I decided not to do it in the end. The framing is there for a garage door, so if I do want to install it eventually, it'll be easy to do. In 
And there they are, everyone. 32 foot long trusses delivered. Installing trusses is not an easy thing to do, especially again if you're a novice like me, but by far it was one of the more enjoyable aspects of the build process. You have to get some additional uh, support to get trusses in place. So in the case here, you can see that I went out and rented this um, lift bucket that had the capacity to uh, lift the trusses. And I've also got my dad helping me. He's up there in the bucket moving the uh, moving the lift bucket around so we can maneuver the truss into place. Now, what's important to note here also is that you can see the ridge beams are on the side walls, the load-bearing walls, and you can also see that I've got a number of blocks in place up on those ridge beams, and those are obviously for the locations of the trusses themselves. And I wanted to slow it down here again to regular speed to give you a flavor for the speed and the sounds in terms of the machine. If you are thinking of taking on a project like this, please, as part of your planning process, check your building codes and your regulations. Stop in or have a call with the building inspector for your jurisdiction. In my case, building a pole barn like this in the rural jurisdiction where I have this property, I'm allowed to mill and use this green lumber in constructing this building. However, there's one catch here. I have to go out and do one of two things in putting this roof together. I have to buy engineered pre-constructed trusses or I have to build the trusses with stamped lumber and have an engineer approve them. We managed to get all the trusses installed during the two day rental limit for the man lift so that was a great success in that regard. It was also fantastic having my dad around to help with this work, otherwise I'm not exactly sure how I would have done it or possibly organized it with one of my buddies, but again, fantastic that my dad could help out. Moving these 6x6 posts around was a challenge to say the least. Now again, we're on the front wall here and like the back wall, this is not a load-bearing wall. However, the front wall contains a 12 foot wide, 10 foot high garage door. So the 6 by 6s that you'll see installed here on the front wall are required for the framing for the garage door. Hi everyone and welcome back to the reboot. It's a beautiful Saturday morning, partly cloudy, partly sunny. And I'm going to only be out here for a few hours today, but the objective right now is to build off of the main post that's been put in in the front here that I put in the other day and to put up the wall for the front of the building here. And I think that that's doable in the next few hours because we have a special guest visitor today. And there's the guest visitor today, sitting there on the back end of the trailer. And that is none other than Mrs. Reboot, or Ms. Reboot. Big thanks to Ms. Reboot. That was a lot easier with her help. Oh. 
Installing purlins anywhere from 12 to 17 feet off the ground, this is not easy work. You're up there, you're crawling amongst the trusses, you're wrestling with 16 foot long 2x4s, you've got screws, you've got drills, you've got tool belts, you've got safety lines. It is not easy work. If you're planning on this type of project, understand what you're getting into. I am a novice when it comes to this kind of work. I'm learning by doing. I feel confident given that I'm using the proper safety equipment, but I am not a professional. Those professionals that I've seen fly around up on these roofs doing their work. They know what they're doing. They have a lot of experience. That's not me, so I'm taking my time. I'm slow, um, but I did want to share this uh, work with you because if there are some of you out there thinking about doing this work, be aware of what you're going to get into. If you are not good at heights, you may want to think hard about how you get the purlins on and how you even install the metal roof. This was by far one of the hardest parts of this project. Just want to give you an idea about the effort required to get these panels up on the roof in this method here. If I slip or let go of that panel it is going to fall, possibly buckle. That would be um, about $100 ruined right there. Maybe not $100 but quite a bit. And uh, the wind, there's a slight breeze out there so that getting the panel in this position right here is a little iffy at times as well. This is truly turning out to be more difficult and more challenging than I had anticipated. So for those two reasons, safety and timeliness, I decided to call in a professional crew. I found a local contractor. He showed up with a crew of three, himself and two other individuals, and over a three-day period they installed all of these roof sheets. It's important to keep in mind that these roof sheets are three feet wide, and about 19 feet long. I underestimated how hard it would be to get these in place and I think it was a very smart decision to bring this crew in, have them install it professionally and get it out of the way. With the roof in place, we were able to set up shop inside, as it were. The roof, the cover, makes a huge difference. Anyways, my good friend Michael started to come out and uh, help me with the project. I think he enjoys a good construction project. And I gotta tell you that having the extra set of hands, the company out there, it is a much more enjoyable way to, uh, to work on the project. And Michael knows his way around the tools, so it was a lot of fun. Thank you. 
center right there. Okay, go. I'm good. Perfect. Good on your end? So I've got my cutoff saw set up as usual and so what I'll do is I'll take uh, the measurements for those infill blocks for each window so that's four cuts. I'll do the cuts and then I'll install, install the four blocks and then move on to the next window. Time to put on the safety gear guys. Always remember guys and gals your eyesight and your hearing are more important than a few minutes that you might save not putting the equipment on. Okay guys, going to get noisy, I'm on generator power here. There was freezing rain here, a nice little glaze on everything on this side of the building. It's a new camera so let me have a look to see, yes, it's working. And the third and final window to be blocked. Okay everybody, I am very pleased with the progress. This uh, front face of the building here is essentially ready to receive the metal. Let me do it there. I think we can see it all there. It's ready for the vapor wrap. The one thing that I need to do, let me slide over here a little bit, is that right here on either side of this post, so right there or right there, I've got to put a door, a man door. So I'm probably gonna go buy that this weekend. Love the progress, very exciting for me to be able to get it this far. The roof makes a huge difference. It's a game changer for me. The steel has arrived and with the roof in place I have the delivery stored inside. In this video I'm going to start tackling the installation of the building wrap and then moving forward with the installation of the wall steel, the metal siding for this building. I could be getting a little bit ahead of myself here, but I'm pretty anxious, pretty excited I would say, to install some of the wall metal to see how it looks. Once you start getting into the building wrap and starting to hang the metal siding, the sense of satisfaction is incredible because you really get a dramatic visual change instantaneously. I work in all kinds of weather, hot and cold, sun and snow.
Okay, so I've just cut this divider piece here. As you can see, it tucks in behind this corner trim and tucks in behind the trim on the side here. I'm going to come back here later and put in that side piece there, but this piece fits in nicely. And I'll just tack it in place with a few of these uh, roofing nails. Okay, so here's a quick little insightful observation. How do you tell someone's installing sheet metal for the first time? They use the wrong colored screw on the red steel. So, let me get some of those red screws in first, and then I'll take out all those gray ones. Now a tricky part for a novice like me. If you recall those four pieces that I've put up, there is about an inch and a half sliver that goes right down the side uh, that needs to be filled in before the steel can tuck nicely into that trim on the side of the garage. So I've taken my measurements and now it's time to mark up this sheet of steel uh, and cut it so I can install it into that sliver on the side of the garage as well as above the garage door. Okay everyone, I have a lot of metal for the walls that I'm probably going to have to do some trimming on and with that in mind I went out and bought myself this what's called the Malco Turbo Shear. It is something that you fit on to your drill driver and um, I test drove it a bit yesterday and it seemed to work very well. So uh, here goes and let's see how this works out. Before installing that sheet of metal I just trimmed with the turbo shear, I need to get a drip cap in place above the door. Again, I'm doing the majority of this work by myself, a big uh, DIY build project essentially.
Here I have a piece of trim in my hand that gets installed right on top of that drip cap and receives that sheet, holds it in place. And I My friend Michael is back to help with installing the garage door. Again, if you go and watch the video in terms of the actual installation, link up above, you'll see that I got my hands on a used garage door. Brand new, these things can go, I think, if they're insulated, between three dollars to $4,000. I picked mine up for about $350. This is minimum a two-person job. I wouldn't try doing this alone. A few days before my son joined me to install the door, I cut the various pieces and roughed in the frame for the man door. My son then joined me to help install the man door. I gave him a little guidance and he was able to uh, take it and pretty much lead on the install process. He also helped me install the building wrap down this side of the building. It is a bit more challenging, but I handled the installation of the building wrap down the other side of the building. And believe me, you do have to be a little bit more creative when you're working by yourself to get a job like this completed. With the building wrap in place below the gable ends, it was finally time to have a big push at installing the rest of the metal siding. I start the process of hanging the metal siding by myself, but as you see here in a second, my friend Michael's back pitching in and helping me get this stuff installed. I am exceptionally grateful that Michael took an interest in this part of the project because Without Michael's uh, participation, this would have taken me weeks longer than it did. Installing the windows was rather straightforward, but due to their size, again, it was necessary to have another person there to help me. Again, here, Michael's helping me. In terms of the other two windows on the other side of the building, my son helped me install those, those ones.
Okay, the plan for right now is to do some final measurements for the trimmer around the window. And this is the third of three windows. So this takes a little bit of time for me, being a novice. But then once I get that done, clear sailing all the way down the wall. No other windows to have to trim around. Just worrying about the trim pieces up top. I've already got the drip edge attached here. I've got the uh, roofing nails loosely in there. I'll be able to pull those out, put on the trim, and then add the trim on each side here and here. And then it'll be time to measure and cut for the larger piece there for the siding. With the trim in place, I was able to put this piece of metal siding in place. It took me a little while to get the measurements, measure it twice, measure it three times, and then make the cuts. I really did not want to mess up a piece of metal siding. It also takes me a little bit of time to get it installed here. My sense of satisfaction and pride are growing day by day in this project. There has been a lot of time and effort that went into the planning, a lot of uh, hours that went into the actual building preparation of this project, and now to see it all finally coming together with the beautiful siding going on, it is a great feeling. I punched the red sheets inside on the table. However, I have to go through the pilot holes to be able to punch through the transition piece here. All right. You don't want to pancake the rubber gasket that much. Just snug it up there. If you tighten them down too much, you destroy those rubber gaskets and then they just deteriorate faster. Which limits their lifetime in terms of the weatherproofing that they provide the system. This is your first time doing soffits, Michael? It is. Yeah. It's pretty much my first time as well. And you know, for anybody out there thinking of doing a project like this, it is uh, you know it takes a lot of time you want to do your research you want to go to YouTube you and watch people doing it but at the end of the day you can learn these things you can learn how to cut the tin and uh, learning how to install it is a pretty easy learning curve I would say I'm gonna have to start getting some footage of me doing these things, Michael, or people are gonna think I don't do much, and Michael comes over and does it all. <laughs> the gable ends posed a very difficult challenge for me. I needed to find a way to get up off the ground and be able to work safely at that height. I could have rented scaffolding, which would have been expensive over time, but also difficult to move around as a single uh, uh, worker on site essentially. But what I did is in that earlier picture about 30 seconds ago, 
I built uh, what I called the Roman Siege Tower, which was essentially mobile scaffolding. I built it using leftover lumber from my build process, and at the end of the day it worked out marvelously. It got me up to the height that I needed to be, and uh, relatively safely. There was just no way I was going to be able to get this soffit material in place at the peak of the gable end and the fascia uh, without this rolling scaffolding that I built. It was a, uh, a great idea. I must say I was proud of myself for coming up with it. And like I said, it worked extremely well. As I work on the gable end here and the soffit material, I really am in the final stretch of this project. The project so far being foundation, walls, windows, main doors, and the skin to the building, all this metal siding. There are other things to do that I'll be working on in the coming 6 to 12 months. Electrical, heating, insulation, and some other things to really bring the building uh, up to full operational status, if I can say that. But for this purpose of building a basic pole barn structure, this is the final stretch that you're seeing here, finishing up the gable ends. And if you've made it this far in the video, number one, thank you, but I'm also nearing the end of this video, the longest video I've ever made. Thanks for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have, please subscribe, like, and share. And as I wrap up here, I also want to thank my daughter and my son for coming out and helping me for several aspects of the build process, my father, my wife, Ms. Reboot, and of course, Michael, who came out the most of anybody and chipped in in several aspects of the build process. And finally, in these closing pictures here that you see of the building, a couple of different shots, but most importantly, this shot in the sun. This building looks fantastic. I'm very proud of it. And I look forward to finishing out the electrical, the heating, and the insulation in the coming months. Thanks for watching, and I hope you come back for more videos.